I love singing sometimes. I don't sing publicly, perhaps, very often. I, I like singing when I'm in my car. Uh, usually, what will happen is when I'm driving, and I've got Dorothy in the back seat and Charlotte in the front seat and Samuel behind me in the back seat, and uh, I, I find that when my revometer on my car goes of about four or 5,000, I, I feel compelled to sing the James Bond theme. I don't know why. Sometimes I even go into uh, one of the James Bond theme tunes and actually sing the lyrics to the uh, dismay of my wife. But uh, this, uh, this psalm, or rather this, uh, this passage from Isaiah, we see kind of two songs of rejoicing. That was the most tenuous link ever, by the way. (laughs) Let's talk about what I do in my car, and now let's move on to a theological discussion. Um, And we see two psalms back-to-back from the prophet Isaiah in what is obviously a very short passage, only six verses. And it's interesting that these two psalms are written against the backdrop of a national disaster. There seems to be little doubt that chapters 6 to 12 of Isaiah were chapters written to give hope to a beleaguered people of God. They are uplifting prophecies which we know, now know to be a foretelling of Jesus coming to earth. They weren't written as prophecies of Christ, but we now know actually in the context of Jesus we say, okay, that is actually what God was doing through these prophecies. So perhaps at this festive time of year, this is an appropriate passage to look at. What we have here are two mini psalms of thanksgiving and hope. Verses 1 and 2, one psalm, and verses 4 to 6, another psalm, and they're joined together by verse 3. The first psalm is written in the second person singular and is a call to worship God. It is that fervent call to say, let us worship him. And the second is a communal hymn declaring the certainty of God's victory. So we're going to look at three things today. We're going to look at God being our deliverer, the name of God, and God being our hope and God with us, Emmanuel, God with us. Verse 2 says this, Surely God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. The Lord, the Lord himself is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. Isaiah is looking back at the deliverance that God provided in the past for the people of Israel in the first exodus, where the people were freed from the oppression of the Egyptians. This has a very typical psalm-like style to it, uh, in the same way that many of the Davidic psalms have that kind of style. And there is a surety and unwavering trust in the Lord because of what he has already done in the history of Israel. Now this is a point for encouragement for ourselves that actually we look at this and say, well, what has God already done? Where are the historical markers in our own lives where we see God acting? Because sometimes we can easily forget those. And if you're anything like me, writing these things down is really helpful. There is an encouragement for Isaiah and indeed the people of Israel that it is based on the testimony of God's action in the past. And because of this, there is a certainty of moving forward about who God is and what he can and will do. And again, a reminder to us to say, let's not forget those points in our lives where God has acted. There is, naturally there is an enemy who wants to steal away the truth of the gospel, the truth of the good news for us. And actually, if we remember those points, pivotal points and what it says in scripture and the testimony of what God's done in our own lives, we're more likely to stay on, the, on track in terms of the truth of who God is and not get sidetracked. For Isaiah, the testimony of God's action gave an unparalleled hope of what is to come. God is not ambiguous. He is not vague. Isaiah wrote in the 8th century BC, but was confident of God's coming action because he knew who God was, in part because of God's faithfulness to his people in the past. We've probably all known that that child complaining about how long it is until Christmas. In fact, perhaps we've even been that child. I know somebody who, when they were younger and was waiting for a birthday or a Christmas, their mum would mark a felt tip 
felt-tip lines on the wall of all the days leading up to Christmas. And uh, normally that process would happen with about four or five days less left, the child's getting excited for Christmas to come, and so the mum puts four marks and crosses them off as Christmas approaches. Uh, so it didn't start too early. It didn't start in February, for example. That would have been interesting and made a mess of the walls. But for Isaiah, this first wait was around 800 years. That first advent, in a sense, really the first advent was around about 400 years of people waiting for for what was unknown, but what was the Messiah. Of course, Isaiah is highly unlikely to have been writing much of this, knowing the prophetic significance of his words, but what we see here is a confidence in God's faithfulness because of the consistency of God's actions in the past. He is focused and fixed on the Lord. For us, this is a chance to fix our eyes afresh on Jesus as we go forward into the new year, who is, of course, the author and perfecter of our faith. And just as an aside, there's an encouragement here to be persistent and patient in praying for that thing or person in your life that is on your heart. Be persistent. We see that shown in the New Testament, but be persistent in prayer. Be patient in prayer. Because as we know from Isaiah and other prophets, God's promises came to pass. Simeon in Luke chapter 2 says, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and glory of your people Israel. And of course, that light and salvation are found in one person, and that one person is the person of Jesus Christ. And so that leads us on to looking at the name of God. In that day, it says in verse 4, in that day you will say, give praise to the Lord, proclaim his name, make known among the nations what he has done, and proclaim that his name is exalted. And in some translations from this passage, it says invoke him by name. Names had great significance in Israel. To know someone's name was to have certainty and intimacy with them. Even today, there is an intimacy, security, and even power in being able to address someone by their name, particularly if there's someone of great political or societal importance. Think of some of the names you've heard. I mean, people do tend to go down a a route of having bizarre names for their children, Uh, Brooklyn Beckham perhaps might be a bizarre name, but just thank goodness he wasn't conceived in Peckham. Um, For Israel, when God revealed his name in Exodus 3, God was granting Moses and Israel a special privilege. God says, I am who I am. To know God's name as Yahweh, I am, was of huge intimate importance and significance. There is a privilege of knowing the name of God and thus also knowing the name of God who has been revealed to us in Christ. In other words, knowing the name of Jesus. Throughout the Bible, we see the name of God being mentioned. In fact, it's mentioned 6,800 times. I did count, if anybody's asking. God is the only person that man does not have the authority or ability to name. We see that in Genesis that Adam named all the animals in the Garden of Eden and the one person that Adam could not name was God because God names himself. The identity of God tied up with his name, God names himself. As we have said, the names carry depth and it would be impossible for a man to represent God's enormity in a name. Only God can do that. Moses' encounter with God at the burning bush went like this, what shall I tell them? And we see that in the Old Testament, God refers to himself as Yahweh, which means I am. I am. This name of I am shows that God is totally independent from other living beings. He is not to be contained. He is not to be defined by others. He is defined very clearly by himself. And we see some of the names of God uh, in that last song that we sang. Very specific and clear names of God, all brought together in the I am. 
We do not have a vague or distant God. In fact, in his name, we have a God who is trustworthy, never-changing, personal, and steadfast, and utterly loving. We can see that God is a God who is a person, a someone, not a vague entity. The Bible shows us clearly that from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22, who God is, I am your creator, sustainer, provider, leader, protector, healer, helper, comforter, judge, saviour. And yet in all of this, we can still invoke God by name. We can still proclaim his name. And when we do proclaim the one who is the image of the invisible God, Jesus, it says in Colossians 1, the Son, that's Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, the Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him, in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. Timothy Keller said this, Jesus didn't come to tell us the answers to the questions of life. He came to be the answer. Jesus didn't come to tell us the answers to the questions of life. He came to be the answer. If you look around other world faiths, you've got religious figures which say, I'm going to give you some advice to show you how to live to the way and be the way to God. Jesus didn't do that. Jesus said, I am the way to God. And indeed, I am God. Because of Jesus, God made flesh. It says in Hebrews 4 that we can boldly approach the throne of grace and find mercy to help us in our time of need. God is all-powerful, all-seeing, and all-knowing. There is power in God's name. There is power in the name of Jesus. Healing happens in Jesus' name. Deliverance happens in Jesus' name. Circumstances are changed in Jesus' name. Hope is restored and made alive in Jesus' name. And of course, as it says in Joel chapter 2, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. If there are situations that we're going through, that we want to see deliverance or we see our particularly, particularly hopeless situations, be fervent in prayer and know that all authority belongs to Jesus and that actually he um, can change situations. Emmanuel, <clears throat> God with us says in verse 6 of this passage from Isaiah, Shout aloud and sing for joy, people of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel among you. And some translators say the Holy One of Israel is among you in majesty. And there's a clear link here between Isaiah 7.14, uh, which says this, a very famous Christmas passage from Isaiah. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. There is nothing that speaks of God's overwhelming empathy and love and care for the intricacies and intimate complexities of people than the incarnation, God becoming flesh in the person of Jesus. Jesus, our Emmanuel. There are often many questions about God, especially when we see suffering and bereavement and difficulty. And to these questions, it is almost always impossible to find a satisfactory response. And we shouldn't shy away from the fact that that is often the case. To try and muddle around and try and find that perfect little answer, of course, life is messy. But what we can be sure about is that our response can never be God doesn't care. John 1.14 says, The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. This speaks of outrageous love and a deep desire for human hearts. The American theologian Greg Boyd said this, quoting C.S. Lewis, uh, 
he says, as C.S. Lewis succinctly put it, Jesus is what the Father has to say to us. He is not part of what the Father has to say, or even the main thing the Father has to say. As the only word of God, Jesus is the total content of the Father's revelation to us, wherever and whenever this revelation comes to us. Jesus is the total content of God's revelation to us. There's um, a film, a 1998 film called Hope Floats with Sandra Bullock and Harry Connick Jr. And it's a lovely, fluffy film. And even before you've watched it, you know that it's all going to work out in the end and hope, hope will rise to the top and they might go through a few difficulties, but basically they'll all live happily ever after. I haven't seen it myself <laughs> for many reasons. The main one being that I'm a man. Um, that's so awful, I can't believe I just said that. <laughs> I, I said that to somebody once and they, they rightly chastised me for it. But I still said it here now, so anyway. Um, it's a lovely message, this idea of hope floating to the top and everything's wonderful. But it's not true of life. And it's not true of the Christian message either. You see, rather than hope floating, this hope... This Emmanuel that is steadfast and certain sinks to meet us where we are. And of course, this is no use to anyone if it's just an abstract concept of hope. But if that hope is a person, it becomes a complete game changer. And today, if you take nothing else from this sermon, know that this hope has a name, and that name is the name of Jesus. And so we're just coming to the end now. Verse 3, this linking verse between the two psalms says this, With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. The gift of Jesus on the first Christmas is not just an event we look back to, but it is the pivotal event of the whole of history, of course culminating in the cross and the resurrection. Because of this, the birth of Jesus and his life, death and resurrection, we can receive the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life. Jesus sends the Spirit from the Father so that life is not a journey that we trudge through alone, but we have an intimacy of God through his Spirit. Jesus, speaking to the Samaritan woman in John 4, said this, Whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. At times we may indeed trudge through life, but the arrival of Jesus means we don't trudge alone. Because as the song says, no power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand. Perhaps the challenge for us today is to examine whether or not there are issues and parts of our lives where we still haven't acknowledged that the incarnation happened. Do we acknowledge this game-changing reality in our own lives? And it might just be a question of declaring, Lord, I declare that you are king of this situation. I affirm that you love me. Rabbi Zacharias said this of the Samaritan woman, the Samaritan woman grasped what he said with fervor that came from an awareness of her real need. The transaction was fascinating. She had come with a bucket. He sent her back with a spring of living water. She had come as a reject. He sent her back being accepted by God himself. She came wounded and he sent her back whole. She came laden with questions. He sent her back as a source for answers. She came living a life of quiet desperation. She ran back overflowing with hope. The disciples missed it. It was lunchtime for them. She ran back overflowing with hope. Because of Jesus, our Prince of Peace, that's been the theme of this Christmas period, we have hope. And we can say in all situations, it is well. It is well. Horatio Spafford was a Presbyterian lawyer in uh, the 1870s, I believe. He, he was a, a lawyer whose business was actually destroyed in the great Chicago fire. And 
the year later, after losing his business, his wife and three daughters got on a boat to go to Europe. They were headed for, I think, for England. And halfway across the Atlantic, there was a boat crash. It, it struck another boat and sank, and only Horatio's wife was actually rescued. And when she got to England, she wrote a telegram back, which was two words, survived alone. And so Horatio Spafford got on a boat to get back to his wife. And whilst on the boat, and I've just got these words from here, so I'm, whilst on the boat, he wrote these famous words. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. This festive time, let's come afresh to him. This man who is God, Jesus Christ, who is the hope in the despair, the light in the darkness, the comforter in grief, the way, the truth, and the life that we may sing to the Lord, for he has done glorious things and declare with certainty, it is well, it is well with my soul. Amen.